um, provides here. Um, so uh, uh, I'm Julian, for those who don't know me. Um, been, yeah, been LGN fan for, for a while. I'm running the Twitter, by the way, of Libra Graphics Media. So if you have any complaints about that, <laughs> it shouldn't be. But I wanted to talk about a project that I started like a few months ago, uh, following something that uh, you might know of, which is this project called Folk Awesome. Uh, for those who don't know, it's a, um, it's an um, icon font, right? That's been quite popular. Uh, not Folk Awesome, Font Awesome. That's the one. I'm already jumping. Uh, so you, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, Windows machine. <laughs> uh, Ford Awesome. Oh, no, no, I wanted to start with Ford Awesome, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it's part of the confusion. You understand? So Ford Awesome creates this project called Font Awesome, which has been used by millions of websites. Um, you probably know the version 4.7, which is only you can only find from here, by the way. Um, and they advertise for the new version. But basically, it's this icon font that's been used on millions of websites. Uh, you've seen them um, everywhere. Who doesn't know about this project? I'm curious. No. One, two, plus. Okay. So if 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 you if you design websites and you don't want to or web apps or whatever you call them right now, um, it's it's like if you want a quick set of icons, you just import this icon set and and then you you you're pretty much covered for a lot of a lot of cases. But what happened is that they advertised themselves as an open source project on GitHub. Um, let's find their GitHub page. Um, and I've been actually uh, annoying them um, because I, I made um, basically file issues and made pull requests. And especially since last year, because I'm a big fan of a project called Mastodon, I asked last year, in, in April 2017, to add the Mastodon logo to the icon set because I think people would find that useful to ask to add the icon next to their handle name and use that to, on their website. But as you can see, the issue is still open a year later. Even if even the, the main developer of Mastodon uh, joined in, he came with a new logo, showed the files, and in the end, I made myself. Um, I did the, the, the pull request for it, which was denied. And it was denied for a good reason, is that since 2016, they've stopped accepting any pull requests to add new icons, and they started a Kickstarter campaign, uh, of which they, re they, they, they received a million dollars for it. They were asking for 30,000. And they switched to a different model, where now they're releasing the font in three versions, or two versions, a free one still with Creative Commons. A licensing, but they're promoting for a pro version, which you pay for. And since my pull request was not accepted, uh, and I was uh, there's been so many pull requests unaccepted for people who wanted to add new icons, I decided to fork it, and I forked it. Uh, I first asked uh, actually the console of um, uh, two people that are here, uh, Nathan and and Brandon who were there to see if it was a good idea to fork and if it was legitimate, you know, forking is still a big deal in the free um, free software movement. So yeah, I decided to fork it to a project that I call Fork Awesome, right? Um, and that's what we've been, do, uh, been doing for the last couple of months. Um, what we started doing is uh, adding a lot of new icons, which you can see if you go here. So we've added a lot of icons, such as for Mastodon, of course, about new social, Hubzilla, and even Scuttlebot, for those who know uh, the social network. Um, we added icons for open source projects, such as Charlie, or and other like non-open source projects uh, in, in the mix. And so this has been, um, the, my point of doing this is that I was frustrated that uh, w what they were calling themselves an open source project, an open source design project, if you wish, were not accepting pull requests uh, for design yeah, improvements or adding to the sets. 
And also they were like keep focusing on basically the main author of the project, which is Dave Gandhi, which did most of the work of, of the fund itself. But I thought that it wasn't really beneficial to the community, and especially with the latest move they made, uh, which I mean I'm very glad for them that they managed to, you know, take that much money and and turn it into a um, profitable project, but somehow it was kind of, for me, betraying what I think open source design could be. Um, so what we've been doing uh, with this project right now is I've onboarded uh, in the project a few uh, contributors. I've also, um, in the website itself, uh, mentioned uh, and, and did the work of going through all the contributions that have been done in the past to actually reference them um, and acknowledge the contribution of every people that have participated in Fort and Font Awesome, but also since then, uh, since this moment, uh, all the people that have participated in the Fort Awesome project. Um, I'm giving also access to the repo to some people, and we've been tackling issues and discussing design and improving on the project. As you can see, there's already like 35 issue closed. Uh, the project itself has received, uh, uh, I can't, well you can see that, but um, yeah, 300 stars, and people are starting to use this in, in their own projects as a replacement, because it's a, basically for people who want to replace um, Ford, it's awesome, with <laughs> Ford, awesome. It's, it's really like using either CDN files that we're using right now, and you can see um, it, it's getting quite some hits, or uh, downloading the files and just replacing. We basically haven't changed anything. We're keeping the code as it existed. We're just adding new features and new items. And so if you find this interesting, I welcome you uh, to talk to me or to join us on GitHub and participate. Um, the goal is to really uh, turn this into a community project and move out of the single person who decides everything and, and owns everything in the end. That's it. That's my presentation. I, actually, in my slides, I wanted to show you something. Uh, we've been um, accepting uh, uh, pull requests for icons, uh, especially, uh, where is it? There's one for XMPP. Uh, basically, that icon I, I wanted to show you, but was open. The issue was open since 2012 on the Font Awesome. So we finally closed that issue in 2018 with Fork Awesome. So that's the kind of like things that I'm, I'm, I'm proud of with, with this project. And I invite you to join. It. Thank you. This is a very much improvised talk because so the slides are actually in German and I hope um, I can explain from the context uh, what this is about. And there also is a chance that I already did a talk on this <laughs> project uh, at a Libre Graphics meeting. Um, this is something that um, kind of I'm, I'm being kind of obsessed now again, although the project itself is something that uh, is with me since at least 2006. Um, the, the goal is to have uh, a MIDI to SVG converter, basically trying to uh, use MIDI files and convert them to something you can plot out on a laser cutter to uh, play music from. Um, so uh, the, the talk I gave at the MakerCon uh, a few weeks ago, I gave together with Jörg Mann. Um, he is a musician and also a writer for mostly O'Reilly. And um, let's just skip to the story. Basically, we met at a summer music festival, um, which is like a world music festival um, somewhere in, in, the, in, the, in the middle of Germany. And um, yeah, basically, uh, it's a quite colorful event, and uh, there were a lot of discussions going on, and they were discussing, um, I, I witnessed people discussing a pr uh, present for the organizer, 
of this event, and uh, they were talking about uh, having a custom music box playing a song from the organizer. And yeah, and I told them, uh, actually, I did something like this. Um, so, I'm sorry. <laughs> So this is actually the, the start of my part of the story there. The, this kind of music boxes uh, we are talking about here is something I know for a very, very long time already because my father had one of these things. I remember playing, playing with this thing uh, as a child. In 2006 I bought my own and uh, the, the idea is basically, oh, I can just show how these things look like. That sound? So, very nice little things. Um, and the music is encoded as holes in the paper strip. And um, so the first thing you do is actually you get a paper strip with uh, black dots printed on it and you're supposed to uh, use a small hole puncher to clip out all the black dots. And um, yeah, this is something that gets annoying fast. <laughs> <laughs> so my first goal was to, to actually build a robot to, uh, to, to punch holes. And I actually started and uh, bought uh, products which were supposed at some point to end up as this kind of robot. I had a nice little design in an aluminum plate and I found uh, what kind of uh, works to Google for to find the right things to punch holes into paper and uh, transport me mechanism and whatever. Turns out um, I'm not a mechanical engineer. <laughs> So this is something, basically it's in the same state today, this project as it was, uh, well, but then I'm used to projects which take quite a long while. <laughs> uh, so, um, and then in 2011 I uh, attended the uh, case communication camp and um, turns out um, there was a FabLab truck from uh, the Netherlands, uh, the FabLab truck, and it looks actually like this which this is actually not a photo from this event that the, the truck is the same and it's just to make a fab lab on wheels um, there is a laser cutter in it there are uh, there were three, 3d printers in it and uh, so at that point it made like click and i thought okay i can do that uh, because i know how to deal with uh, graphics i know how to deal with uh, MIDI. i already had written software to uh, pass MIDI files and um, extract the, the relevant information. So all I had to do was to create graphics that I could then print out on a laser, on a laser cutter. <coughs> yeah, and uh, basically this is in, in 2012, then the meeting with um, Jürgen happened, and um, this actually uh, was a totally different view uh, on, on my project because he also had, has bigger plans. Um, um, let's just uh, skip to this, to, to uh, a little bit to the technic things. Uh, I know of four different variants of these kinds of music boxes. They basically look like, like this. This is a 15 note um, a C major scale, uh, or oh, major scale um, uh, scale. Yeah. Uh, so, so this is a bigger variant. Uh, it has 30 notes, um, has actually has some chromatic notes in, in the middle, and um, the uh, plus some bass notes, and uh, yeah, and this is uh, actually mechanically or uh, from production quality the nicest one, but it is limited to 20 notes and uh, a major scale as well. So. Um, how do the, these things work? This is this is disassembled version. You can see there are the metal strips that produce the sound by getting plucked. They get plucked by these kind of wheels, and the paper strip 
basically goes through like this, and the holes enable the pins on the wheel to enter the hole and uh, then get pulled forward, plugging the metal strip down here. There are four of these pins around the wheels. You can see that here. This is from the bottom. Um, so basically, um, yeah, this is about it. You, you have uh, two two uh, Walzen. <laughs> so uh, no idea. Uh, paper is uh, transported between two rollers. Thank you. And um, the holes allow the wheels to grip into the paper strip, and uh, well, the next pin then plugs the metal strip. Um, yeah, so, uh, what I find kind of interesting is that there is a whole range of things you can actually do if you have these kind of objects you are more or less obsessed with. Uh, you can uh, start by just printing out something which you then clip by hand. You can try to find a way to, to do actually laser, use a laser cutter to do this. You can build a uh, hole punching robot. Um, and uh, you can try to automate the playing as much as possible. Uh, you could also be happy with just sampling the, the music box and um, just using your regular MIDI software to play stuff, or you can even go a step further. This is not a project for me. This is, has cropped up in the last few weeks. It's actually actuating the uh, pinwheels with individual servo motors, so you have like 30 servo motors here. <laughs> and uh, it actually is possible to live, do, do live music playing with this thing. It's quite an impressive project. Um, and yeah, so you have this big kind of spectrum and um, you, you have the, to find where your project is and my project actually stops for now at the laser cutting of the whole, uh, whole, whole strips and yeah, that's it. Um, I'm not sure if, uh, how much in, into how much of a detail I should go. Um, I could tell a lot about parsing files. I could tell you a lot about uh, creating the graphics using, in this case, Cairo. Um, but I guess um, I'll stop for now, and uh, if you're interested, feel free to contact me. Thank you. Not, I didn't think of it. Sorry. No, it, it won't show again. I, I, I can show you generated PDFs uh, on my laptop. It's basically just uh, an outline with lots of circles and uh, yeah, and there's a little, little bit of strategy uh, strategy involved because the laser cutter in our fab lab has some mechanical issues um, regarding the precision, so I had to do slight workarounds, but this is very much nitpicking. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So, um, I think some of you may be familiar with this project that I've been working on. I presented it a few years ago. Uh, at another LGN in Leipzig, and it's still going. I mean, it's fits and spurts, but the project is still kind of active, and there's still ongoing experiments. So I wanted to. I guess I should give some people some. If you're not familiar with it, some background. So the idea of this greenless office is to come up with. I call it an artistic operating system, not because I think it's somehow uh, pretentious somehow a superior to non-artistic operating systems, but because by calling it an artistic operating system, I can get away with not being um, efficient or working in a way that would be expected of a proper operating system. So um, I, I decided, I mean, I, I guess 
One of my problems is that I feel like the screen is, uh, I mean, it's obviously a very powerful interface, but it, um, it's kind of obvious in some ways. It, it, it gets us into certain habits of ways we work, and maybe some of these aren't good, or maybe they can be kind of boring. It might be, if, so if we're going to do something that's experimental, why don't we do the most difficult um, and get rid of the most obvious aspect of the whole thing so we get rid of the screen. So things become really difficult, but then maybe there's some interesting ideas that come out of it. So what I sort of started with, the first functional thing was um, I thought, OK, how do I get through my day? I'm still using the internet, but how can I not use a screen? What do I need? So the first thing is, all right, so I can avoid sitting at the breakfast table with my laptop or with some other device looking at that. And so I started making, basically, it's an RSS reader that this is what I print out every morning. <laughs> so I have... So you reinvented newspapers? I've reinvented <laughs> newspapers, but it's up to the minute. It's really up to date. You know, it's not like hours old, like one of these old newspapers. <laughs> <laughs> so this is fresh. Can I have it? Yeah, sure. Can That's it right. Yeah. And so basically then, <clears throat> the way it works is it, um, yeah, I have RSS feeds. It grabs the RSS feeds, then um, it, in order, I mean, I mean, I like images, even though it's screenless, I still want some images, so I go and I get the open graph headers from the HTML and pull out some images maybe, and then if there's a, a particularly interesting article, then, so these are just the summaries, then I take out my barcode scanner and I scan the barcode, which then prints out the web page. So then the, the web pages look like, um, like here's a few examples like this. You know, it's a pretty kind of boring layout, but you know, if anyone has design critiques, I'm open for it. Please, we can talk about it, whatever. Um, and here, if anyone's interested, I'm actually using um, the browser, so I'm using Firefox and rendering it to PDF. And the trick I do is when I pre-process it, I strip out, I use um, some, uh, what's the thing? Uh, the, it's the reader view. I forget what the component is. It's still a reader. I think, yeah. And it's a, basically it's a Python implementation which strips out most of the junk. And that's also one of the things that I like, that it's sort of like taking the control back with the interface, that if you're browsing the web, but you're no longer, there's no pop-ups, there's no annoying thing that's hovering over it and saying like, please turn off your ad blocker or this kind of <laughs> stuff, that it's all stripped out and I've just, you know, just got the parts of it that I want. I mean, it doesn't, there's a lot of sites that don't quite render properly, so then occasionally I do have to open up <coughs> my laptop, but um, I'm okay with it. And then, yeah, the main sort of operative thing that goes on is I scan through all the links, and then I make a, a number, a footnote number where the link would be. So then if you're reading the text and you see a little footnote, then you can go to the end of the document, and then instead of clicking the link, you scan the barcode, and then that prints out the next one. So that's, I've gotten through a certain amount of my day with that. I also have... Um, the layout is awful, but I can, I also have my inbox, so I have some simple IMAP stuff that grabs my inbox, tells me everything there. And in some ways it's kind of nice because I have one that's like spam and delete, so I can really quickly just get rid of that stuff. <laughs> but I can also print out pages, and then uh, what I have in terms of, oh yeah, I guess I should show you this as well. So then uh, Twitter, of course, you've got to social media. <laughs> so this is... Um, Twitter will print something. Yeah. So I have a receipt printer. So I've got my A4 printer, but I also have a receipt printer. Um, I recently implemented, so I can even do the debugging. So now if, um, if there's a stack trace, it actually prints out. <laughs> which is kind of nice. I mean, usually in the screen to do that kind of stuff, so that's a little bit of without that. Um, so 
Yeah, so I've been working on that for a few years, and different people have helped me. And the other thing I have is, in terms of input, um, is I built a, a document camera. So the software right now, I have it, it's running on this sort of, uh, it's actually a, like one of these Raspberry Pi-esque things from this Bulgarian company called Olimex. It's not very fast, it could use some optimization, but I mean, the whole point of this is to be, you know, do a little sort of slow computing anyway, so it works out. Um, but, um, yeah, so the, I use this document camera. So if I want to post something to Twitter, I have this, I should have brought an image, I don't have one here, but um, I have a sort of A3 sized black blotter and I just put something down on it. You know, it could be one of these things or I could write something on a piece of paper and there's a switch so that I can set the size of the actual image that I want to post, somewhere between A6 and A3. And, um, and then I can set the orientation if it's landscape or portrait. And then when I scan here, the, um, the menus. Uh, yeah, exactly. So here's the, the menu of my software. So when I scan here, tweet, or I even, I did implement Facebook, although I think I'm going to get rid of it because it just seems quite a sound. But, um, <laughs> I, I occasionally post do post to Twitter, and what I can do is I just scan this barcode, and then it, the, I have an LED light that turns on, and it takes a photo of whatever's on this surface, and then uploads it as a tweet. Do you print the photo before tweeting to no. see if it's good? <laughs> no, I just have to hope that it's good. I mean, I can then, well, I can reload my own feed and print it out, and then I can get some idea of you know, if I really screwed up, if it's out of focus or something. <laughs> Although actually, no, I have a fixed focus thing, so it's not. But yeah, for some reason, the composition is bad. I guess I can see that. But um, yeah, so that's sort of going on. How much um, paper do you buy per month? <laughs> not that much, actually, because that's the thing that I realized is that um, by I mean, paper, you see it. Like, once you start, you realize how much I'm printing out. You know, I printed like 10 pages one morning while I'm drinking my coffee. And I think, like, I think that's maybe enough for now. <laughs> and then I'll sit there and read it. I mean, I use recycled paper, I use both sides. It's, you know, I try to be aware of it. But there's this sort of feeling that, um, uh, that, you know, I mean, come on, I think about it when you're sitting in front of a screen. I mean, you may have something. In, if you have a decent sized screen, that thing probably uses like maybe, I don't know how many watts, like 60 or 80 watts or something like that. And you're sitting there for hours going on some like deep dive into obscure parts of Wikipedia or something. And it's, you don't have, there's no point where you see this stack of paper that you're like, oh my god, I just wasted two hours researching um, like obscure snakes or something. And there's never, whereas here, at some point, you're like, this is ridiculous. I just printed 40 pages. I can't stop. <laughs> you know, um, it's, for me, it's a way of like, being more reflective about this, this usage, because with the screen, it's really, it sucks you in. That's part of what makes it amazing, but it's also scary. So yeah, so the input stuff is still kind of the main problem. So um, a friend of mine is a Dutch hacker named Herben. And he ran into one of these things. Moleskin puts out this very fancy digital pen, which works with their very fancy notebooks. And these notebooks have this microprinting on them. And the way the pen works is it has a camera inside of it. And the camera will recognize the x and y coordinates and which page it's on, which page in the notebook. And so it saves this as a sort of little stream of data on the pen. Um, and then if you are connected by Bluetooth to your PC, then they have some apps that, or to a smartphone or whatever. It then will send this stream of, of basically vector data, of you know, path data to um, their various apps. Now, Kevin figured out that uh, they had published some kind of specs to this thing. And uh, 
we went through the spec and we realized it wasn't that complicated and we managed to get a sort of rough prototype working. And I thought, all right, this could be cool. This could be a nice way. What if we work it out that we could make basically like a screenless content management system? So that instead of having, you know, some you know, gigantic Drupal setup with you know all this stuff, then you just say, all right, fine. You want to update the website? Okay, here. Here's the pen, the paper, <laughs> you do it. And then you sit down and you write whatever, and if you screw up, I guess you have to cross it out. Um, the erasing doesn't quite work, but that's the same way with pens. I mean, it seems consistent with this. So I can give you guys a quick demo. Um, The synchronization is essentially, so this is an SVG embedded in a minimal bit of HTML. And then what we do is then append um, the, the end of the SVG with more path data. And we're just using our <coughs> to, to push that so that it's not, so we don't have to sync the whole thing every time. Um, but this probably should be done with some kind of Cool web sockets, whatever thing. If anybody knows about this stuff, then I'm interested to hear about it. Um, but let me give you a quick demo. but it seems all right if you ask me. Um, yeah, so what I brought, I, but the thing is right now I'm not sure what to do with this thing. I think it's kind of cool and it's fun, but I'm, I don't know. But I think this is a room full of interesting people. Um, so I have one, and this is a cool thing about these pens is they actually publish some PDFs. So you can roll your own and print your own uh, whatever formats you want to cook up. So I thought if people are interested and want to try it out, maybe we could do something where we try to make a kind of improvised publication. I don't know, we could start people want to make comment. I have no idea what people want to do. But I thought it would be an interesting <laughs> format to play with. Um, so I have this book and maybe we can have a beer tonight and people can give me some suggestions and then tomorrow we can maybe come up with some kind of scheme for passing this around and um, see if we can produce some interesting little experiment. Yeah, so, yeah, that's all I have. Uh, do, you, do you keep an archive of all things you printed through all days? Uh, no, usually I throw it out. <laughs> it's a relief, like, you know, to just recycle it and like, be done with it. A few things I do keep, or I like, I, the other thing I've gotten into is kind of like scrapbooking. So I'll have, you know, if I have an interesting image or one of these, you know, like a, something here, or a tweet that where I like the image or the text, then I'll just like cut it out and paste it into my notebook. And then there's a lot of other stuff where it's, I mean, I think it's, it's good to be able to, it's one thing that's also a tendency with the digital, is that storage is cheap, it's getting cheaper every day, and this everyone becomes like a sort of crazy librarian, and we never throw anything away, and then it, it, you get a lot of crufts, and it's kind of, 
maybe good to, I mean, I like this, I can totally understand this, it's, been, it's great, you know, archive.org. But um, at the same time, I think it's good in terms of my, you know, I don't want my apartment to be full of crap. And I'd be nice if my digital life could also have a certain level of tidiness to it. And this may be my weird way of trying to figure that out. Any other questions? Please. If it's if it's an artistic operating system, who's the audience? Mm -hmm. Who's the audience? The artists. Us, you. I think I. I mean, it's to be totally egotistical. I'm the only user. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's not, but it's also it is. It, there's code, and it's actually not too bad. There's only one dependency where I just figured out how to. Um, I mean, it's it's complicated to get it going, and depending on what hardware you want to use, we may have to, I may have to help you out, but it's not so exotic. So if anyone is interested, I'm totally surprised. Surprised and very <laughs> happy to, to help you like get your own screenless office running. But I think for me, it's about, it's also about confronting this idea of universality. Like that's one big problem I have with a lot of interface stuff, is it's based on this sort of old modernist idea, which is in some ways kind of nice, you know, like with the Bauhaus and this idea that we uh, should design for the people, but it implies this sort of, there's a kind of arrogance, you know, that like this um, idea that there's a universal standard that is good for these kinds of things. And I'm, by doing this in a way, I'm provoking to say like, well, maybe that's not really true. Maybe there's like a weird, messed up, personal way that all of us would like to interact with these things and maybe that's okay to to do that, to come up with your own more personally uh, acceptable way of, of dealing with all this, this media. Because it's not easy. It's kind of, it can be too much, I think. We all know. Yeah. Okay. Anyone else?